All right, well, let's go ahead and take a look at the next passage of Scripture that is in Romans. And Paul here is, as he's bringing the, uh, the letter to a conclusion, he is giving uh, particular uh, applications. Uh, so not painting with quite so broad a brush as he was doing earlier um, when, you know, we did take sometimes rather large chunks because... Paul was building the arguments and, uh, for the one topic, and so we'd look at that, but now he's just giving us bits and pieces. Uh, last week we saw he was talking about his desire to, to visit the, the Romans uh, as he had finished evangelizing the Eastern Mediterranean, wanted to go to Spain, and how he was hoping uh, to visit them. But there was something that he had to do first, and that's what we read about this morning. So... Romans 15, verses 25 through 29, Paul writes this, But now I am going to Jerusalem serving the saints. For Macedonia and Achaia have been pleased to make a contribution for the poor among the saints in Jerusalem. Yes, they were pleased to do so, and they are indebted to them. For if the Gentiles have shared in their spiritual things... They are indebted to minister to them also in material things. Therefore, when I have finished this and have put my seal on this fruit of theirs, I will go on by way of you to Spain. I know that when I come to you, I will come in the fullness of the blessing of Christ. Well, may the Lord bless his word to our um, understanding this morning and our um, edification, our growth in grace, and may we see in these examples of the churches that Paul's referring to, as well as his own example, and the example of Christ, may we see, again, just the glory of God's love and, and be drawn out by that to want to imitate this, to want to put this on as a part of our character. Now, last week, again, we saw Paul's missionary strategy. He didn't want to preach where Christ was already named where the gospel had already reached, building on someone else's foundation. He wanted to break new ground, uh, to go where no man had gone before with the gospel, right? He wanted to take the gospel where it had not yet gone to establish new places where, or from which, I should say, it could sound. Remember, his strategy was to plant churches in major metropolitan areas so that it would reach all the smaller areas as people came and went. From there, As he expressed it to the Corinthians, he saw his ministry as that of planting as opposed to Apollos' watering. He said both are good, both are necessary. He doesn't appreciate anything that Apollos was doing. He saw that also as vital. But Paul realized that Jesus had called him to be a trailblazer. You know, as I thought about that, I thought, in a sense, he was kind of like David Livingston. I don't know if you remember what we saw of David Livingston um, years ago, and we considered in our Reformation series the great missionary movements of the church. But David Livingston spent his entire life breaking ground, mapping out Africa, so that those who came after him would be able to reach the entire continent. Now, unlike Paul, David Livingston didn't really preach the gospel in the places he went. He just simply mapped out Africa, although I do think there was one person that he converted, and that one, well, the Lord used him to convert, and that one person actually reached a number of other tribes with the gospel, but his work made it possible for those coming after him to do things they otherwise would not have been able to do. Well, Paul is doing the same thing, only along the way he's also planting, planting new churches. Now, Paul said that this was why he had not yet made it to Rome. There was still unreached territory that needed the gospel up to that point. Rome already had a church. They already had a gospel witness. His work there was not as urgent. But now we see that he had finished evangelizing the eastern Mediterranean. It was time to reach toward the west to go to Spain which, as we saw last week, was the westernmost fringe <clears throat> of the Roman Empire. <clears throat> this would take him by Rome, uh, where he hoped to visit the church and to be helped by them on his way. 
Now remember, Luke doesn't tell us whether or not he actually accomplished this. Uh, he ends the book of Acts with Paul's first Roman imprisonment. But church history bears out that when he was freed from his first Roman imprisonment from 62 to 66, he made a fourth missionary journey uh, and that he reached Spain, fulfilling Jesus' prophecy, remember, in Matthew 24, 14 in the Olivet Discourse, that the gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in the whole world as a testimony to all the nations, and then the end will come. And what Jesus meant by that, at least on the interpretation that, that I think is strongest, that the good news would reach the entire Roman Empire, which was the, <clears throat> the world in those days, before the end of the Old Covenant system in 70 AD. That's the end Jesus was referring to when God destroyed the temple and Jerusalem in his judgment against the Jews. <clears throat> <clears throat> but before he could begin this journey to Spain, he said that there was something he first needed to do. He needed to deliver the contribution the churches in Macedonia and Achaia had collected for the relief of the Jewish saints in Jerusalem. Our topic this morning is <clears throat> serving the saints. And our passage gives us several examples of this very thing. Now, first, I want us to consider the um, Gentile believers' desire to serve the saints in Jerusalem by taking up a collection. Okay, Paul tells us about this in verse 26, and I want to point to their example first because Paul's example is taking that contribution to the saints in uh, Judea. He says, for Macedonia and Achaia have been pleased to make a contribution for the poor, among uh, the saints in Jerusalem. Now, Jerusalem was deeply impoverished at this time. I think it really was during the entire time of, of the, the old, or excuse me, the New Testament record in the, in the book of Acts. Um, the world had faced a great famine uh, 10 years earlier under Claudius, during which the church in Antioch had sent relief to the Christians in Judea. And there, I just want to note, they were practicing the very same thing that Paul is, is, going, is, was, is telling us, that um, the churches in Macedonia and Achaia, uh, the obligation they were under as well. And Antioch was considered the center of Gentile Christianity. The saints in Judea were suffering, but they gave them relief because of their indebtedness to them. Now, we're not told what the exact cause was of the, of the difficulty of the Jewish believers at this time. It may have been from lingering effects from the famine, or it could have been from the Roman occupation and taxation, which made life consistently difficult and financially challenging for really all the Jews in Judea. But you can also add to this the persecution that the Jewish believers had to suffer from their countrymen. But whatever the reason, they were, they were suffering. Now, when the churches in Macedonia, and you know, that, that can sound rather general, but what, what Paul has in mind here is Philippi and Thessalonica, but we know, you know those were the two main centers. When they heard of their struggles, they determined to take up an offering to relieve their suffering. And as they then started to do this, and, and not by any you know, commandments on the part of Paul, Paul saw what they were doing and used their example when he wrote to the church in Corinth, which was the major metropolitan center of Achaia, to encourage them to do the same. So here we actually have an exposition of what was going on in Paul's second letter to the Corinthians. So let me read that for you now in chapter 8, verses 1 through 9. He says, Now, brethren, we wish to make known to you the grace of God which has been given in the churches of Macedonia, that in a great ordeal of affliction, their abundance of joy and their deep poverty overflowed in the wealth of their liberality. For I testify that according to their ability and beyond their ability, they gave of their own accord, begging us 
with much urging for the favor of participation in the support of the saints. And here he's referring to the saints in Judea. And this, not as we had expected, but they first gave themselves to the Lord and to us by the will of God. So we urge Titus that as he had previously made a beginning, so he would also complete in you this gracious work as well. But just as you abound in everything, in faith and utterance and knowledge and in all earnestness and in the love we inspired in you, see that you abound in this gracious work also. I am not speaking this as a command, but as proving through the earnestness of others the sincerity of your love also. For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sake he became poor, so that through his poverty, or excuse me, so that you through his poverty might become rich. Now, notice a couple of things about this text that Paul saw this love, this generosity of the Macedonian Christians as a grace that God had given to them. Okay, this, is, this is the absolute opposite of man's fallen nature, isn't it? I mean, the spirit of the world is selfishness. That's what sin is. That's what the flesh is all about. It says, get as much as you can so that you can enjoy life to the full. By the way, I hope that doesn't describe the way we're living because that's the way that the world lives. Paul reflects on this in the 15th chapter of his first letter to the Corinthians when he tells them that if there is no resurrection, which means there's no final judgment and no final punishment, then the conclusion would be, let us eat and drink for tomorrow we die. In other words, let's focus on self-indulgence. But that's not the case, okay? There is a final judgment, there is a final accounting for the stewardship that God has given to everyone. Now, the grace that God gives us by His Spirit produces a different attitude and one which is suitable to prepare for that final judgment, and that is a selfless attitude, which doesn't say, how much can I get? How much can I enjoy? But how much can I give? How much can I relieve the suffering of others? How much can I, can I contribute of my time, of my strength, of my prayers, of my resources? What can I do to help others? Now again, isn't that the way our Lord Jesus Christ lived? Now think about this. It's not that the Macedonians were fluent as though they were entrepreneurs who had made all this money and they were simply looking for an avenue in which to express their charity. Paul says they were also afflicted, probably by Rome and Jewish neighbors, uh, these churches being <clears throat> perhaps primarily Gentile. But he says they were also deeply impoverished. Okay? They were not wealthy. They were also suffering. Now, it's obviously not uncommon for believers not to have a great deal. Paul told the, the Corinthians, he didn't choose many mighty and noble and wise, people who were affluent in order to save. Remember what Jesus said in the Sermon on the Plain, not the Sermon on the Mount, but the Sermon on the Plain, that's the one in, in Luke's Gospel, something that sometimes we have difficulty wrapping our minds around in Luke 6, verses 20 and 21. He says, blessed are you who are poor, not just poor in spirit here, but poor, for yours is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you who hunger now, for you shall be satisfied. Now, Jesus isn't saying that if you're poor, you're automatically in the kingdom, and if you're rich, you're automatically out of the kingdom, but he is saying that poor people are more apt to actually be converted, and God has chosen more among them. James writes this in James 2, verse 5. Listen, my beloved brethren, did not God choose the poor of this world to be rich in faith and heirs of the kingdom, which he promised to those who love him? Now, why is that? Why the poor? Well, it's because the poor more often see their need of the Lord Jesus Christ. They sense their dependency on God, not their self-sufficiency. 
I think it's instructive uh, that years ago when a home fellowship group that we were involved in, uh, we were going out doing street evangelism, and we did it in different areas of, of town, some really ritzy places and, you know, tourist traps and other places that were really down and out. And we found that in those affluent places, there were very few, if any, that would listen to what we had to say about Jesus Christ and the gospel. But that wasn't true in the not-so-affluent areas because they knew they had needs. So the point is, there really weren't that many rich Christians. There were some, but most of them were poor. And that was the case with Macedonia and Achaia. But in spite of their poverty, Paul says, they overflowed in the wealth of their liberality. They, they really didn't have anything to spare. That's what it means to be, you know, of course, poor and in need. But they gave anyway. And Paul says they gave generously. And Paul didn't have to, you know, put the thumbscrews to them and, you know, force them to do it or shame them into it. They begged Paul that they might be able to contribute to the needs of the saints. And Paul, pointing to the example of the Macedonians, writes to the Corinthians and those in Achaia, but as you abound in everything, in faith and utterance and knowledge and in all earnestness and in the love we inspired in you, see that you abound in this gracious work also. In other words, you see your brethren up there in Macedonia making the sacrifice and showing their love to the poor saints in Judea? Then love as your brethren in Macedonia. Now, not just because they did it, of course, but they should do it because he says, this is what Christ did for you. By the way, everything that Paul says to them in this text still applies to us as well, doesn't it? We should do this because this is what Jesus did in, in chapter 8, verse 9 of 2 Corinthians. For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sake he became poor, so that you through his poverty might become rich. Paul writes to the Philippians explaining what Paul is, what he's saying in, in 2 Corinthians 8, 9. He says, Jesus existing in the form of God did not regard equality with God a thing to be grasped or held onto, but emptied himself, taking the form of a bondservant and being made in the likeness of men. By the way, he didn't just become a man. That wasn't, that wasn't the, the, just you know, the entirety of the stoop, but he, he was born into the poorest families. Uh, he, he didn't become a king in a palace, but he became a poor child of a carpenter. Uh, just emptied of all the world's riches and just living probably from day to day in, in his youth. But being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. So to put this in other terms, Jesus was infinitely rich in his divinity, his deity. But he took on himself the poverty of humanity, even the poorest, that he might make us rich. He has made us through his work the heirs of his kingdom. And as we are predestined, Paul is saying, to be conformed to his image, he says, follow his example. Because Jesus, he did live in order to justify us, but he also lived to give us an example to follow. So they, or we, should do this because Jesus did this. Now, another reason we should do this is because however we treat each other, we are also treating Jesus. Yeah, that, he doesn't mention that, but that also comes into play here. You know, sometimes when we read the sheep and goat judgment, we think that, that Jesus is judging the sheep and the goats based upon how they treated everybody in the world. But that's not what he's doing. He's actually judging the sheep and the goats based upon what they did for those who were Christ's brethren. He says in Matthew 25, verse 40, Truly I say to you, and this is to the sheep, to the extent that you did it to one of these brothers of mine, notice he's talking about his people, even the least of them, you did it to me. You see, when we serve one another. 
and meet one another's needs. And again, not just the small fellowship here, but others that we're aware of outside of this fellowship and even throughout the world, what we do to them, we're doing to Jesus. And as we look at what Jesus says to the goats in the great white, or excuse me, the sheep and goat judgment, which is the great white throne judgment, we find out that what we don't do to them, we're also not doing to him. He says in verse 45, truly I say to you, to the extent that you did not do it, to one of the least of these, you did not do it to me. Which is why Paul says in Galatians 6 verse 10, so then, while we have opportunity, let us do good to all people and especially to those who are of the household of the faith. I mean, we're to help our neighbor, love our neighbors ourselves. Remember the good Samaritan, he wasn't helping somebody who was his brother, but somebody who was his enemy. We need to do that as well. But particularly, he says, those who are of the household of faith. But Paul gives one more reason why they and why we should give, because it was their duty to pay back what was given to them. Now, notice what he says in our passage in Romans 15, verse 27. He says, yes, they were pleased to do so, and they are indebted to them. For if the Gentiles have shared in their spiritual things, they are indebted to minister to them also in material things. Now, that, that's interesting, isn't it? Because we don't often think of it in these terms. But Paul is saying to these Gentiles, to the Macedonians and, the, and, and to Corinth, he's writing, uh, well, to the Romans as well. If we're sharing in Israel's blessings, then we, we should also pay back physical blessings if they're in need, okay? They owed the Jews a debt God had made His promises, remember, to them. The covenants were theirs. Theirs were the fathers. Um, from them was the Christ. The Gentiles, of which Rome was a part, they were far off. We were as well, strangers and aliens without God and without hope in the world. But because of the Jews' rejection of Christ, which was a part of God's plan, he turned to the Gentiles, he turned to us and gave to us what was meant for his people, that he might make the Jews jealous. Remember, that was Paul's argument back in Romans 11. Through their rejection, God has brought his riches to, to the Gentiles, to us, which makes the Gentiles, which makes us their debtors. That's kind of an interesting concept, isn't it? Uh, does it still apply today? That's something we need to think about. Are we indebted to the Jews today? Um, possibly, but Paul's going to go on to say we are indebted really to everyone from which we receive a benefit. Now, let me just mention next that Paul saw himself under the same obligation, uh, not, not because, you know, he's not a Jew or he's a Gentile, but because of what Christ has done for him. He saw himself under the same obligation, which is why, you know, to serve, which is why he wanted to take this contribution to Judea. So he says in verse 25, but, but now I am going to Jerusalem serving the saints. And this is also why he wanted to go to Rome, that he might minister to the Jews and to the Gentile saints who were there. He writes in verses 28 and 29, therefore, when I have finished this, taking this contribution from these churches to Jerusalem and have put my seal on this fruit of theirs after I've authenticated its origin and its intent to let them know of, of their Gentiles' brethren love for them. I will go on by way of you to Spain. I know that when I come to you, I will come in the fullness of, bless, of the blessing of Christ. Now, the love and the mercy that Christ had showed him placed Paul also under a debt that he could never repay. None of us can repay the Lord. All he could do was love his Lord in return by serving him and serving his people. That's what he means by coming in the fullness of the blessing of Christ, coming in the power of the Holy Spirit to do what he said originally at the beginning of Romans he was going to do and that is to share his faith with them 
and to be encouraged by their faith. Now, what this tells us is, again, uh, this, I mean, as we wrap this whole thing up, that we are debtors to those from whom we receive, okay? We, we become indebted to those who show us grace and mercy and charity. Uh, let me ask you, are children not indebted to their parents? I don't think they think they are, <laughs> but they are. We're indebted to our parents for all the love and all the care and all the concern, all the service. You know, again, as children, we don't realize that. Hopefully, when they grow up, they'll, they'll realize that. And what I mean is not when they become adults, but when they grow up, okay? Because it takes a while for children to grow up in this culture. But, I mean, we might have come into this world thinking that our parents were always the age they were and that, they, that their only reason for existing was to take care of us. But when we get older and we realize that wasn't the case, we begin to see how indebted we are to them for all that they have done for us. So that places us under a debt, a debt of honor. You know, we don't like to think about it, but citizens are also indebted for the benefits that we receive from our, you know, governors, our magistrates, and so forth. That's why we pay taxes to support that. As believers, Paul says, we're indebted to those, all of us are, to those who teach us God's Word. You know, when we receive from someone then we are to give to them. Paul says in Galatians 6, verse 6, the one who is taught the word is to share all good things with the one who teaches him. But most of all, we're indebted to God, to the Father for giving us the Son, to the Son for taking our nature upon himself, living in our place, dying in our place, in order that he might save us, and to the Spirit, for breaking the sin in our hearts, the bondage we were under. We were fast bound in sin in nature's night, you know, as we come into this world, but the Spirit broke those chains and He gave us the power to live a godly life. We are indebted to God really for everything. So how are we to repay this debt? Well, Paul says, you know, there's differing ways Treating our neighbor, you know, loving God, worshiping God, loving our neighbors, ourselves, all these things are very important. But in our text, loving our brethren, okay, we cannot repay the debt that we owe to God and to Jesus Christ of our justification. If we could do that, we wouldn't have needed Jesus in the first place. That's why, you know, again, the idea, Pelagius, that we just follow Jesus' example is ridiculous. We can't do that. We can never make up for the debt that we owe coming into the world. We can never live a perfect life that Jesus lived. We can never repay that debt, but we need to remember that doesn't mean that we owe nothing. We, we owe a debt we can never repay. We owe Jesus everything, and He tells us how He wants us to pay it. By paying it forward, if I can use that term. By loving His brethren. When we do that... We are actually doing that to Jesus, as I've already said. We are blessing Him. Jonathan Edwards said something that was really interesting because we tend to think, and, and it's true, we better think this way <laughs> anyway, God is infinitely blessed. He's perfectly blessed. Uh, he could not be any happier than He is. He, he never goes through any kind of grief or sorrow. He's, he's always perfectly blessed and of himself. And Jesus as God is exactly that way. He's perfectly blessed, okay? And there's nothing that we could possibly do to add to God's happiness. And yet, when God became a man, he became one who is finite. And one who is finite, not, not he didn't give up his infinity. It's, you know, can't say everything at once, but... Becoming finite, that means that his happiness can actually increase. And so when we minister to his people, we are actually adding to the happiness of Jesus Christ because when we serve and give to them, we're actually serving and giving to him. And that's really the point I want to leave us with this morning. Let's try to be aware of each other's needs, if, if they should exist, and the church's needs outside of us. And let's think about how we can minister to Christ 
how we can minister to our Savior who, who loved us and laid, laid down His life for us and paid a debt we could never possibly repay. How can we minister to Him? By helping them. Well, let's, let's bow in a moment of prayer and let's, um, let's ask the Lord just to help us work this out and, and, and apply this. It's a very broad principle.